I'm Anita Brooks Kirkland. At this point in my career, I've been around the block a few times when it comes to advocacy. The first in this pair of videos, Advocacy Approaches, provides advice from the experts. In this follow-up, I humbly offer my own advice. It starts unequivocally with the premise that we all own it across organizations and across the profession. We own school library advocacy every day through our actions, what we do to demonstrate exemplary ex instructional practices, how we speak, and how we relate to others. My mantra? Action is eloquence. Thanks, Mr. Shakespeare, for the quote on my daily fridge ma magnet reminder. So here are my top 10 tips. Tip number one, advocacy is a long, hard slog. If only we could just make it so. The fact is that it takes time to effect change and a serious investment in just sticking with it. Based on years of research and experience, that is exactly how library scholar and leadership expert Dr. Ken Haycock defines advocacy. My own definition of what I like to call action advocacy draws on his advice and adds the element of universal responsibility and concrete actions. Tip number two, accountability is a critical part of effective advocacy. Remember Wendy Newman's advocacy basics? People make decisions for their reasons, not our reasons, and that we need to respect those reasons. School libraries exist to advance student learning. How familiar are you with the educational priorities in your province, territory, or state? Are you directly involved in your school's success planning? Can you effectively communicate how the library program will help the school succeed in its goals for student success? Do you have a plan? Have you thought about the unique contribution that the library program can make to, to help achieve school goals? Have you written it down? Have you shared it with your principal? If you've gone to the principal with your handout for money, don't expect an open ear if you haven't got clear ambitions. And as every good educator versed in backward design knows, you need to plan like an assessor and be able to report on outcomes and impacts to inform future growth. Tip three, leverage the library's unique value proposition. Learning in the library has unique value and characteristics. But it's not a competition. Can you articulate the unique value of learning in the library and how that adds value to the overall school experience? And for goodness sake, expunge phrases like more than just books from your lexicon. When have libraries ever been about just books? The foundational principles of librarianship have been around for a very long time. The belief in access to information for everyone and that knowledge comes from the free exploration of ideas. Characterizing the new school library as more than just books shows disrespect for this long and venerable history and does nothing to instill confidence in stakeholders. The new and exciting instructional practices characteristic of the Learning Commons approach are evolutionary, not revolutionary. Sinek's Golden Circle model tells us that when what we do, how we do it, and why we do it are aligned, people have no problem understanding what we stand for. Most of us can tell people what we do and even how we do it, but have a much harder time articulating the why. Sinek's advice? Start with the why. Start with a we believe statement rather than a what we do statement. Try this one on. In the library, we believe in the power of inquiry, creativity, and the free exploration of ideas. Isn't that going to make it easier to explain the value of that new maker space? The other part of this tip is not expecting others to understand what you have to offer. How do we expect them to? People's perceptions of the library may be based on their own childhood memories or on stereotypes that pervade pop culture. Start by asking colleagues about the learning goals that they have for their students and then make connections to what you can do to help move those goals forward and open up a world of possibilities. Tip number four, embrace measurement to demonstrate program efficacy, which happens to be the topic of my chapter in this new book from the OLA Press. 
This is a big one, so we're going to spend a bit more time examining the idea of measurement. Fellow book contributors Mo Hosseini Ara and Rebecca Jones are advocates of the logic model of measurement and identify the bad habits into which we may have fallen when thinking about metrics. We make the mistake of measuring stuff rather than measuring the success of our goals. What are our goals anyway? As they say, it's much easier to hit the target when you know what the target is. In education, we call that planning like an assessor. Ah, relationships and alignment. If we want to demonstrate our efficacy, then we better have the conversation with principals, other teachers, curriculum specialists, and yes, students, to help us plan our strategy. Well, what can I say? If we as teachers have not absorbed this advice, it's a sad day for education. We understand that assessment is part of learning, and so should it be part of, uh, of learning about our program's efficacy. The number of books that you circulate does not tell you very much about the benefits to students. We need to measure outputs like circulation stats in terms of how they inform outcomes and impacts. Your goal is to engage students in reading. Circulation statistics may be an indicator, but they are not the goal. We don't find time to think about measurement. It's worth it. Make the time. On our way to the news conference announcing the first Ontario study into school libraries, the lead researcher advised me, the OSLA president at the time, to not put all of our eggs into the cognitive basket. And he was right. The impact of the library on student learning is very important, of course, but the library experience has broader impact in all areas critical to student success, like health, social-emotional social skills, and cultural literacy. We know that assessing learning is about way more than the final mark, and that we can gather evidence in multiple ways, and we understand that the inquiry process embeds assessment for, of, and as learning at all stages. Taking the next step to analyze effective practice at your school contributes to the body of evidence about program efficacy. Why not share your learning? We know that we learn through stories, and a story well told can be a very compelling way of conveying your message. As I recently overheard library advocacy guru Wendy Newman explain, stories give life to data, and data gives authority to stories. Gather that qualitative data, summarize your observations, record your conversations. You're already using these to assess learning. Use them to tell the library story. Take advantage of the opportunities to share that evidence in those stories and contribute to the body of Canadian research that we so desperately need to build. And my last point on this huge topic of measurement, Consider using leading learning to provide direction to your program's growth and use its indicators to measure your success. It's all about growth, learning and collaboration and will help your school to move forward. Advocacy tip number five, expand your circle of influence. Yes, we know it's all about relationship building, but just exactly how do we do that? How do we all own that one? We all have a circle of concern, things that we worry about and that have an effect on the way we live or the way we do our job. We make a choice in what we spend our energy on within this circle. If we focus on our energy on factors beyond our control, we tend to always be in re reactive mode, blaming and accusing and feeling victimized. If, on the other hand, we take a proactive approach, Focusing on things that we can change, we expand our circle of influence. No, each of us individually is unlikely to be able to change provincial policy, but we can make our programs more effective, build relationships with our teaching peers, and have conversations with our school administrators. Action is eloquence. Tip number six, know your stuff and be able to draw on the research and history to back up your own approach. As Doug Johnson reminded us, pulling big studies out of our back pocket is likely not the best first approach in advocacy, but we need to be able to demonstrate that our approach is based on sound research and theory. Be sure you know your stuff and use current guidelines to inform your approach. Some really smart people wrote this stuff after all. 
Number seven, get rid of that chip on your shoulder. I can't tell you uh, the number of times I hear these responses when introducing new instructional strategies. Oh, but at my school, or my principal doesn't understand what I do, or I'm a digital immigrant, I can't learn all of this technology. Don't get me wrong, I have empathy and believe me, I understand the challenges. But what I also know is that complaining is often a disguise for absolving oneself of responsibility. It's someone else's problem. Inaction is ineloquent. Tip number eight, language matters. How we say things either shows respect or disrespect for de decision makers or for our own program. Marketing gives us an opportunity to help others understand the unique value proposition of learning in the library. Just make sure that the message is positive, not preachy. We are getting quite good at marketing stuff. Can we take up this challenge and market opportunities? language matters. If your starting point in advocacy is framing the situation as a crisis, it really gives you nowhere to go. Might as well give up as invest in this problem. And for goodness sake, don't dismiss the unique value of the library with an ill-chosen meme. If you think I'm minimizing the problems we face with all of this positive talk, don't get me wrong. There are times when we need to take a principled stand. Just make sure that when that time comes, you don't revert to screaming from the soapbox. Instead, advocate with the evidence and draw on the relationships that you've worked so hard to build. And last but definitely not least, the very best advocacy is being the best at what you do. Together, we can not only survive, but indeed thrive and lead learning from the library. Both of my advocacy video presentations are available on this page of my website.